Let's open our Bibles this morning to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. So we continue verse by verse on Sunday mornings. If you need a Bible, there's help yourself. There's Bibles in the back, on the shelves back there. They're free. Take one home. Use it. Uh, give it away. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart with that, if you need a Bible. John chapter 19, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 16. Verses 1 through 16, and let's go ahead and we'll read that and then we'll pray. John chapter 19, verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put it on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. Let us pray. Father, as we come to this somber ground within your scriptures, Lord, we pray for touched hearts this morning, Lord. We ask that you would bind the enemy of our souls who likes to blind the mind of the unbeliever, Lord, to lead astray the believer. Father, may your Holy Spirit fall afresh on us this morning, Lord, as we study your sacred word. Speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have to be honest with you, when we come to this portion of Scripture, whenever we're studying through, whenever I'm reading it through in my own devotional times, it is one of the hardest things for me to read through. Because every single time I read it, it cuts me to my heart. It cuts me to my heart because I know that every, every lash that Jesus received, every mocking comment, every spit, I deserved, and more so. And as Christians, we need to come to this sacred ground and really understand that this is talking about our Savior. And look at verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, whipped him. Now the bummer sometimes about the scripture, about becoming so familiar with the scripture, is we can read these things and continue on and not understand what's really being said. Well, well he scourged him. Does that mean he took him to the side and, oh, you bad guy, you? And what a, you're just a terrible... No, they took him out and they whipped him with the cat of nine tails. 
And on the end of this whip, it was a whip that had kind of went out like almost fingers, if you will, just different strings. And on the end of those, they would tie glass, they would tie metal bits, and they, they would, then they would whip him. And it was supposed to be 40 lashes, but they would minus one for mercy. They took Jesus out and they whipped him. And they whipped him. And they whipped him. 39 times. Look at verse 2. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And then they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail the king of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Let me read to you from Matthew chapter 27. Matthew's account, it said, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. When they had tris twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him, took the reed, and struck him on the head. Anyone here ever had a splinter? Raise your hand if you've ever had a splinter. How about a thorn from a rose or some other thing? A blackberry bush that we have so many of. Imagine having a crown of those on your head, first of all, being put on. And if you see, saw the thorns that, you know, the bushes, you know, in Israel, they're, I mean, they're, the thorns are like this. They're massive. And then imagine somebody hitting you on the head with that. Digging in, breaking thorns. And, and on top of that, they're making fun of Jesus. They're scourging him. Oh, hail the king of the Jews. They struck him with their hands. And again, for me, beloved in Christ, these are some of the saddest words, if not the saddest words ever written to man, to women. Jesus didn't do anything to deserve this. Not one thing. Not one thing. But he still allowed it. This is amazing. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and start hitting you and beating you that maybe you're six foot tall and they're three foot tall and you could just, you know, hold one hand out and they could be going like this trying to hit you? I would normally stop them. Maybe thump them on the head. That's enough. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus allowed them to do all these things. Well, he could have just with it, he went, boom, they're all dead. They're all disintegrated. They're all, you know, turned into, you know, little rabble on the floor, on the ground, smoldering embers. Boom, he could have, you know, done that and reversed it. He could have had legions of angels come, but he did not. Why? Because he loves us. That's a little loud for you to say, Pastor. You're kind of getting a little... I, because it's so worthy to be loud. If I can get out and I can yell, Go Seattle Seahawks. Go American in the you know, World Cup. I, which I don't, to be honest with you. Never quite got soccer. If you love it, God bless you. <laughs> but if anything is worth shouting, it's the love of God for you. Jesus endured all this because he loves you. He loves me. And what I love what in, in Hebrews, let's turn just briefly to Hebrews chapter 4, please. Just keep your finger there and flip back towards Hebrews chapter 4. And we gain an insight as Jesus is suffering, we gain an insight into his heart. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Beloved, are you in a time of need this morning? Where are you with Jesus Christ? Where am I? 
And what, one, what more apropos time for us as we come and Jesus is going to the cross as he is enduring all of this for our sin to take a step back and say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, all these people have hurt me in my life, but Jesus loves me. All these people right now even may be hurting you in your life. Maybe you've been rejected. Maybe you've been abused. Maybe you're ill. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Let us then with confidence draw near to his throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. When's the last time, beloved in Christ, you drew near to God's throne of grace to find help in your time of need? Oh, I know so many that will turn away from Christ and they'll turn back to the bottle. Or oh, they'll turn to the television. They'll turn to sex. They'll turn to other things. And instead of coming and just throwing themselves at the feet of Jesus Christ, his throne of grace, because we have a high priest who knows what it is to suffer. Remember, at this point, he's been betrayed by all of his friends, all of his followers. Those who said, oh, even if all these other boneheads, even if they forsake you, Lord, I will never forsake you. Really, Pete? You're going to deny me three times this very night, dude. And even after Peter did it, we read in another gospel that Jesus looked over at Peter. And you always wonder, what was that look? What was that look? Was it disgust? I don't believe it was. It may have been a little bit of hurt, but I believe there was a whole lot of love. It's okay, Peter, I know. That's why I'm here right now, I know. You can't do it in your own. You can't overcome sin on your own. I'm here to save you, Peter. You can't save yourself. And that's why, Jesus, we have a, a Savior who knows what it's like to suffer. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. Isaiah 53 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Amen? Amen. I love how the Lord works, by the way. We're in, we just finished 1 Peter chapter 2 where these very verses were quoted. And as we read this morning, we see that Jesus was beaten. He was mocked. Look at verse 4, please, back in our text. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know I find no fault in him. For you Bible students, underline that. I find no fault in him. As we read earlier, and we will study in a few minutes, we see that, that Pilate even says, don't you understand I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? So here's the governor now saying to everyone, I find no fault in him. Isaiah 53, 9 says, And they made his grave with the wicked and the rich man to his death, although he had done no violence. Jesus was completely innocent. I find no fault in this man. 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one, him who judges justly. He trusted himself to God the Father, even in the midst of his suffering. And Pilate, even as he says that, as he says, I find no fault in him, look at verse 5, it says, Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. No doubt whatsoever he is covered in blood. Covered in blood. Because they said that even as they would whip, it wouldn't just be the back. As the whip would come around, it would come around even to the front. And the guys that would do the whipping got so good that they would literally tear skin from the front as they pulled it back. Pastor Bill, that's a little too graphic for me this morning. We need to understand that. He comes out. No, so Because we read in the scripture, he came out. It's almost like, hey, here comes Jesus. I... He's wearing a crown of thorns, and we can romanticize it. Oh, there's, woo, there's Jesus. No, he was covered, drenched in blood. But notice what Pilate said. Pilate said to them, 
Behold the man. Again, for you Bible students, underline that. Circle it. Study it. Behold the man. Jesus, again, had just been beaten, spit upon, mocked. He was bloody from the crown of thorns and being beaten. He had been whipped. And yet there stood Jesus, our beloved Savior, standing there so that Pilate said, Behold the man. Now some say that this was Pilate actually showing respect to Jesus. Look at this guy. He just, be, he just put up with this beating. He got just put up with you know, being whipped 39 times. Behold the man. And, and by the way, all this is going on, we read it and we think it's like within five minutes everything happens. This beating and everything is in about a three to four hour time period. It didn't happen quickly. Jesus was suffering. And yet as he walked out, Pilate said, Behold the man. So is it perhaps that, you know, Pi, you know Pilate is just like, Wow, look at this guy. Or is it perhaps that he's looking to the Jews saying, Behold the man, look. I just had this guy whipped and beaten for you. Isn't, isn't that enough for you? Behold him. Are, are you done now being angry with this guy? But even as Pilate says, behold the, lamb, behold the man, how can we not flash back to John the Baptist be saying, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There was the lamb of God standing there. And remember, beloved in Christ, he could have stopped it at any time. Any time. Verse 6 in our text says, Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Ha! <sighs> How would you like a pastor like that? Amen? A religious leader like that? Woo! You put in front of Billy Graham and a whole bunch of guys and they just sit there, crucify him. Cru they wouldn't do that. We pray. But that's what we need to understand. These are the religious leaders of the day. And here they are. They see Jesus blighted. They see him beaten. They see spit hanging from him. And they're still saying, what? You know, Pilate's even, behold the man. Pilate's not even a believer. Behold the man. And what do they cry out? Crucify him. Crucify him. So caught up in their own sin were these religious leaders that they even continue in sin to request a death, a form of death that was not legal according to the word of God. Cursed is the man who hangs upon a tree. The Jews detested this form of punishment. And yet here are the religious leaders, so blindly, the blind leading the blind. You know, it's interesting. Religiosity blinds those who practice it without love to warm the heart. Let me say that again. Religiosity blinds those who practice it without love to warm the heart. Beloved in Christ... We need to be those who not only read the scriptures, know and study the scriptures, but walk in love with our God. Amen? But to love justice and to walk humbly with our God. That's a great study, by the way, if you want to just take a little thing, you know, you want something to do this afternoon, do a little study on walking with God. All the times that's mentioned, just... You know, I, I love how the Lord came to visit Adam and Eve in the cool of the night to walk with them, the cool of the evening, to walk with them. Enoch walked with God and was not. But these religious leaders had become so hardened, that their own sin. And we need to understand that, 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 you know, what has it been said that the same sun that melts the, the wax's candle is the same sun that will harden the clay? And we need to be careful, beloved in Christ, as this applies to our lives, that as we are reading the scriptures, as we are walking with Jesus, that our hearts don't become hardened. 
You see, because as we hear the Word of God, as we read the Word of God, even this morning, as we're hearing the Scriptures and reading the Scriptures, if our heart is not just pricked to the bone, just, just cut open, cut to the quick, what's wrong with us as Christians? If we can sit here and, and be hardened by the words of God, be careful because we are on the way to becoming a Pharisee. Maybe some of you are already there. It, it, it amazes me sometimes. We had Pastor David Hawking out here a few weeks ago. Wonderful time. Wonderful people. A lot of visitors. It was so sweet. But I have to tell you, there was a few people that called it were like, dude, are you even Christian at all? Yelling at us. With my wife, I'm just like, what is up? You need Jesus. You don't need to just come and hear Pastor David. You need to be born again of the Spirit of God. You know, Jesus called it being lukewarm. You know, you're neither hot nor cold, and you're lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You see, these religious leaders, they would have, everybody would have looked at them and say, oh, they're, they're, they're definitely going to heaven. Oh, they're wonderful people. They're, on the outside, they were. They would do all the things. How, how is that about us this morning? Do we do all those religious things? We come to church on Sunday because, well, we're supposed to do that. Or do you come because you love Jesus? Do you read his word because, well, Pastor Bill keeps telling me I'm supposed to read my Bible, so I'm going to read it. Or do you do it because you love Jesus and you just can't wait to come and hear from your lover? Oh, what do you have to say to me today? Just hold it. Oh, Lord. Man, I take your promises and I, I read them and I hold them in my heart. I ponder them. You know, it's like when Tilly and I were dating, we would, it was before emails. It was before texting, so we would actually write on paper. It was amazing. I know kids can't relate to that. What's paper, man? What is that? What's, a, what's that thing? What you're writing thing? Just kidding. But we would write notes and letters to each other. I still have them. And I still love to take them out sometimes and ponder them. But you can bet when we were dating, how often do you think I pondered them? Every day, baby. I'd pull them out. Oh, she loves me. Oh, look at that. Look at what she said right there. I think she likes me. You know, when you're first starting to, to, you know, to see what the Lord's doing. And we'd pray together and we'd sing praises to the Lord together. Wondrous times. That's how it's to be even more so. That's just a glimpse of how our love for Jesus should be. And if it's not, then our hearts have grown cold. Our hearts have come become like these scribes and these Pharisees. These religious leaders. Oh, I'm not saying that you don't know a lot about Jesus. I'm not saying that you don't know a lot about the scriptures. These, these guys knew it all. But they forgot about loving God. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and all thy strength. That is the greatest commandment. It wasn't to know the scriptures with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind and strength. But it is through the scriptures that we come to know him more intimately. And I have to, we just, beloved, as we, we are here this morning, man, may we take care of our hearts and souls. If we've, if we've come to let the things that we do that are religious and, and supposed to be good, if we've come to just do them out of habits... Our Father, who art in heaven, I'll be the name of the kingdom, come the Lord, and understand. We're going to say, dear, I believe, because our trespasses will be to those who trespass against us. At least not temptation, but leave us from you, amen. That's one. I got, you know, eight more to do. And I would do that. That's how I used to be. I would rattle off that Our Father instead of, hey, Our Father, hey, you're my Father. Which art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed Lord, be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, man. Thy will be done on earth. And then I'd even add, in my life as it is in heaven. Do you see the difference? One's religious, one hardens my heart, one softens my heart to him who is above all, to him who died upon a cross for me and my sin. And beloved, we need to heed this warning, especially within the culture that we are living in today. Verse 6 continues, Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Notice for the second time that he says, I find no fault in him. 
And instead of do, standing up and doing what is right, he just says, well, you take him and do what you want with him. He knew Jesus wasn't guilty. He knew, we read in another uh, passage of Scripture, that they were jealous of Jesus. Why didn't he stand up? He was the one in power. He was the one that God had set there at that moment, in that time, in that day. You see, beloved in Christ, this man was not standing up and doing what was right. Instead, he cedes to the wickedness of the leaders. He was over them, by the way. He had complete power over them. He could even have them all killed. Instead of standing up and doing what's right, he didn't do that. You know, beloved in Christ, we need to note here that God does not excuse those who have political power and do not use it for the good of the people and to punish evil as we are told in the scriptures they are to do. Amen? Amen. God does not excuse a political leader who does not honor God. The right thing for Pilate to have done would have been to punish the Jewish leaders for bringing false accusations against Jesus. And by the way, their own law declared that they should have been put to death the same way that they were seeking to put Jesus to death. Yet Pilate didn't do this. Instead, he yielded to the will of the people. What's the application for us? May we never yield to the will of the majority or even the minority or even our own wills, but to own, always to the divine will of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. We need to be those men and women who, you know, it doesn't even matter what I feel about this right now. Well, I feel that abortion is okay. It's a woman's body, and I feel that that's, you know, it doesn't matter what you feel. Well, I feel that it's not okay just because I, I don't like it. Does it doesn't matter. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God said, Thou shalt not murder. Well, the, it's not really a baby. It's a fetus. Well, actually, in the Latin, fetus means what? Young one, young baby. Well, uh, that's not what we mean. It's not really a human yet, and... Uh, you know, really? Then why did John the Baptist leap for joy in the womb when Jesus came in Mary's womb? Again, it doesn't matter what we think about anything. It doesn't matter if the whole world goes in one direction. It doesn't matter if pot becomes legal in Washington. Amen? You guys tried that yet, by the way? Good. No hands going up. Good. I was going to say, grab them! No, just kidding. <laughs> Stone them. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just because the state of Washington declares pot to be legal, that doesn't mean it's okay with God. Amen? Amen? And we need to be men and women who know where in the word to go to address those things. And not go along with the majority, but what the Lord says. Verse 7 continues, The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Oh, the religious who are so hardened of heart are so selective in their laws. We're ignoring and we've broken I, countless laws last night and this morning there, Pilate, but, and we're even you know, breaking some more of our laws by asking you to crucify him. But, but according to our law... He ought to die because he made himself the son of God. You know, one of the things I hate, one of the, the things that on the top of my things list that I hate is prejudice. I, I hate prejudice. Matter of fact, one of the things that drives me even more nuts is when a pastor or religious leader will stand up, any color, by the way, any nation, and spew forth this hatred and try to use the word of God to justify it. Wickedness. Wickedness. And that's what these big guys are basically doing. They're ignoring their, their, the laws and they're just trying to highlight certain ones. Well, according to our law, he must die. And notice why they say he must die here in verse 7. Look, because he made himself the son of God. Now, in our culture today, it's like, well, so we claim to be the Son of God. What's the big deal? In that culture, in the Jewish culture, to claim to be the Son of someone was to claim equality with them. 
I am Sina, Simon, son of Barjona. That means Simon, you know, Bar means son of Jonah. And he was equal. He was a human being. So when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he was claiming to be God. We need to understand that. I've always found it interesting by those who actually say that Jesus never claimed to be God. Because he certainly did. It's not even a question. That's why the Jews were looking to put him to death. Well, it was just a misunderstanding. John 10 Verse 30 through 33, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. The Jews, they knew exactly what he was saying, and they took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them and said, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. If you go on to read that, Jesus doesn't go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now look, I'm the Messiah, okay, but I am not claiming to be God. He doesn't do that, does he? When Thomas falls down at his feet, my Lord and my God. Whoa, dude, you're only supposed to worship the Lord alone as the angels do. Remember when John in Revelation falls down to worship the angel? Dude, whoo, hey, I'm a created being just like you. Stand up. We only worship God. Jesus claimed clearly to be God. And we need to understand that. And that's why he is being sought to be put to death. By the way, earlier when we read there in John chapter 10, that was the correct form of punishment that they should have done for Jesus. But again, their hearts are so wicked, so corrupt. Verse 8, therefore when Pilate heard this saying, he was even more afraid. Ah, the truth comes out. Pilate was afraid. Pilate was a man who lived in fear. I mean, think about it. He's living in fear of the Jewish leaders, even, who he's over. And, and, you know, we can get into the whole politics of the time that that it was always, Jerusalem was always in upheaval. There was always people coming, trying to overthrow the Romans and all these different things. And, 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 And Pilate was like any other politician, if you will. He wanted to work his way up. So the less trouble there, the better. So he's trying to appease them, and so he's afraid of that. But even now, when he heard, what? Did he heard that, you know, that um, Jesus, that they, he's making himself to be the Son of God, Pilate now is even more afraid. Flip with me over to, please, to Matthew chapter 27. We read something very interesting there. Matthew 27, verse 19. Matthew 27, 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, this is uh, Pilate, by the way, his wife said to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Pilate was warned. Pilate was warned. And even now, back in our text, we read that he was more afraid, and verse 9 goes on, and went into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not listening to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you or to re- and the power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. As we were praying before service, I asked the guys, hey, did you guys catch my big mistake when I was preaching last week? Did any of you, by the way, there was a a huge mistake I made last week while preaching. Some of you are nodding your heads a little. I said last week that, you know, when, when Pilate asked what is truth, I said, you know, well, that Jesus in the scriptures doesn't speak to Pilate any further. I was sick last week. It was still wrong. It wasn't even in my notes. I don't even know why I said it. I was just a bonehead. But I still want to let you guys know, and gals, hey, you know what? I made a mistake, and I want to say I'm sorry for that. Because I take my preaching very seriously. Very seriously. And again, what a great reminder to each one of us to be a Berean. Because I will make mistakes. I am a human being. I know it's hard to believe. I know. Just kidding. And I am just kidding. 
But back to here, Jesus does speak again. Notice Pilate's actually, hey, aren't you speaking to me? Don't you know? Who, where are you from? All these questions now are coming from Pilate. We know he's now afraid. Well, you know, I grew up knowing about all these Greek gods and the Roman gods. And, you know, where, where are you from? What, what is this? What's going on? What's really going on here? Don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or to release you? And Jesus here Remember how Pilate said, what is truth? Jesus gives him a dose of truth. You know what, Pilate? You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. It's interesting. You could have no power against me at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, this last week, we read, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man's for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to the governor, as to those who are sent by him. Sent by God. God the Father. You see, beloved in Christ, God is completely sovereign. Amen? God is completely sovereign. That means he is in complete control at all times. And he is the one who gives power to men and women. And you know what their responsibility is? Is to use it for the glory of God. Amen? Hey, and I'll tell you what. In our culture today in America, shame on America, by the way. We're following right down the path of the Europeans who, oh, well, it's so ungauche to believe in God. And you have a candidate who will come up and actually believe in the Bible. And what happens in the mainstream media? They're made fun of. Or even our founders, as they said, you know, that we're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable truths. The freedom that we have as Americans, our founding fathers recognize, does not come from any government, does not come from any king, it comes from God Himself. And even Pilate here, he didn't understand. Look, Paul, Jesus is saying, Look, Pilate, all the power you have, you wouldn't have anything unless my Father had given it to you. And notice how he says, he goes, Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, just a quick few things within this statement here. It's interesting that notice that the sin of the Jews is greater than that of Pilate, the religious leaders who turned Jesus over. Secondly, we see that Pilate still had sin within all of this. The, the Jews' sin was greater, but they're still saying, it's implying that you still have sin in this, Pilate. And what's interesting, too, and this is a great study for another time, there are degrees of sin. Notice there are sins, Jesus says himself here, greater sin. Great study for you to do, by the way. We're not going to do it this morning. Put it out there. Some of you are like, oh, man. Verse 12 goes on, and from then on, Pilate sought to release him. This, this always, what did he do to release him? What do you mean he sought to release him? He had complete power. He could have just said, you're released. Go away, out of my sight. He could have sent Roman soldiers with him to protect him. You know, but he sought to release him. Well, I'm going to kind of let him go. But the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Ah, the religious leaders, they're not so dumb, are they? They're basically making a veiled threat. If you let this guy go, we're going to send people to Caesar and let him know you met, let a guy go who's claiming to be a king political enemy. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Notice the twisting of words by the religious leaders, the twisting of intents. Again, those who are entrenched in their sin always seek to justify it by threatening others. You ever notice that? They threaten others. They seek to get them to accept their sin or call them not loving. They say they're not inclusive or not being tolerant. Anybody heard any of this stuff lately? It's always by those who are entrenched in their sins. Of course they're going to say those things. And of course we're going to continue in love to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? 
about heaven, about hell, about sin, about forgiveness. Yet these guys, man, they were just darkly twisting the truth. But yet may we always be those who find the light in the word of God. Amen? Amen. Verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat him down in the judgment seat that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. So now he's kind of, you know, trying to, to, to do the whole Jewish people, like all those that were gathered together. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. It's interesting in Proverbs 1 24 through 26 we read because I have called you or called and you refused I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke I will also laugh at your calamity I will mock when your terror comes you know it's interesting Some within Christianity have hated the Jews for, you know, about the last 2,000 years. You read about even religious leaders that you uh, look up to. Men like Martin Luther and others that, that through the years, and in a way as you read some of the scripture, you can almost understand their disdain. But to the one, to the Christian who reads the entirety of the word of God, we need to see our own selves right there amongst the Jews. We would say, I would be there, man. I used to say as a kid, Lord, just give me an Uzi, dude, and send me back in time. I'll just, you know, I'll knock all the Roman soldiers away. I'll save Jesus. And I was serious, too. Okay, I was like six or seven years old. I still remember thinking that because I love Jesus that much. But what we don't understand is it would have been our voice in the mocking crowd. It would have been us saying, crucify him, crucify him. And you might say, oh no, I would never do that. Really, have you ever sinned? Then you have. Because it is for our sins that he was crucified. He wasn't crucified by the Jews. He wasn't crucified by the Romans. He was crucified by each one of us here. That's why sin is so serious. Man, so many in the church just want to take sin and not, oh, it's no big deal. We can keep sinning. And, and Paul, God forbid that we would keep sinning because grace abounds. Our sin put Jesus on the cross. Let us be so careful, even as we finish in verse 16. Then he delivered them to, or excuse me, delivered him to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. Jesus is headed to the cross for our sin this morning. And as you see, I, I do get emotional about this, but on the other side, I get so deeply filled with joy because Jesus loves me. And I can say before the Lord that as I have been in some of the hardest and deepest times of grief in my life, as my brother lay dying in bed, in a hospital bed, having a gunshot wound to his head. Two months before we're to get married, by the way. As he was about to die, I cried out to the Lord as I was walking on the cliffs, saying, Lord, how can you let this happen? Don't you love my brother? He has a baby that's three weeks old. He has two other kids, a young wife. And you know what the Lord told me just in the quietness of my heart? Bill, I love your brother more than you'll ever love him. I love your brother's kids and I love his wife more than you'll ever love them. I died for them. And I wept, but I also found great comfort. And beloved in Christ, we need to be those that even though we see they're delivering Jesus to be crucified for our sin, we still find and experience the great love and forgiveness and joy and restoration at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We don't stay in our sorrow. 
We don't stay in our dead sleepedness. We come to the cross. We take our sins. We confess them. We weep and we mourn. But we leave the cross in the joy, in the victory, in the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Man, we should be dancing for joy right now. Yes. It's rugged to know that our sins brought our Lord and Savior to the cross. And maybe even this morning you're here and you've never repented of your sins. Maybe you've been brought up in a Christian home. You think, well, that's good enough. It's not good enough, beloved in Christ. It's a blessing. But God has no grandchildren. We, each one of us, need to have a time when we are convicted of our sin. We repent of our sin, turning away completely and turning to that cross where Jesus died for our sins. And we come to him and we ask him to forgive us and to be the Lord and the Savior of our lives. That is how we are born again. As we do that, we are made a new creation in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And his Holy Spirit comes to abide and indwell within us. And he changes us radically. Are you changed radically this morning? Have you been changed? Does God continue to change you radically? We were talking with the teens the other day. Hey, Christianity is not dead. We've seen that movie, most of us. God is not dead. Well, let me say this. Let me say amen. Amen? amen. And if our religion is dead within our lives, then it is us and it is not Jesus Christ. And we need to come to him afresh and anew this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we read your word, as we hear and read the terrible news, May we also see the glorious truth behind it, Lord. Your great love brought you to the cross and kept you upon the cross to die for our sins, Lord. And Father, we lift ourselves up to you anew this morning, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. We ask for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. I pray for those who may be of us who have become a little hardened in our hearts, Lord, over time, just for that new wine to come in and soften, that we would repent of that, Lord, and just lay ourselves flat at your cross and be lifted up as we humble ourselves before you, Lord. 